Please pray with me. Father, thank you for the freedom to worship as we are doing this morning. This church is united through your blood. It was your son that came out of obedience and joy to go to the cross, to suffer, to die, and then to be resurrected from the dead in proof that he is your son. So we praise you, we thank you for this time. Thank you, Father, for everything that you've given to us in Jesus' name. Well, this is the time in our service that um, we, as believers, come to the Lord's table to examine our hearts and to celebrate the relationship that we have in Christ. We want to remember that our salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We are saved by faith and trust in the power of Jesus to forgive our sins and to grant us eternal life with him in heaven. So our passage today is from the book of Galatians. It's Galatians 4, verses 4 through 6. Please open your Bibles to Galatians 4. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there are some men up front who would be happy to put one in your hands. Just raise your hand as they come down the aisle, and uh, they'll give you one. And if you don't own a Bible, please feel free to take this one with you. It is a gift to you from Grace Bible Church. So Galatians 4, 4 through 6. Let's read together. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. I chose this portion of Scripture because... Whenever I read of God's saving grace, I am always and will, be ever, will ever be overwhelmed with the joy and the amazement of remembering my day of salvation. His gift of salvation came to me. It was one that I did not deserve, and I certainly didn't earn it. And there's no way that I could ever pay him back for it. Justification by faith alone is the central theme of the book of Galatians. Galatians 4, 4 through 6, describes the nature and work of Jesus and the foundation of our salvation. In Galatia, there were false teachers who were advocating that you must obey the law to its fullest to be saved. Paul is going to dispel that. In the beginning of chapter 4, Paul describes a believer's condition prior to salvation. If you look down at verse 3, it says, So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Elemental things refers to the teaching and principles of the world. In verse 4, God provides the solution to these ele elemental things, his son. It says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. The fullness of time is referring to the coming of the Messiah to earth in the form of a baby. The incarnation of Jesus was not an unplanned event. In fact, the coming of Jesus fulfilled hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament, and it was the culmination of God's plan that was established before the creation of the world. God the Father did not create his Son. He sent him. Jesus preexisted from all eternity past. He is the only begotten God resident in the bosom of God the Father from all eternity, and the two are one. Based on the declaration that God the Father and God the Son are one, it is hard for us to humanly understand 
the implications of the statement, God sent forth his son. In sending Jesus, God did not send a substitute. He sent himself. Continuing in verse 4, it says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus being born of a woman emphasizes that he was fully man and fully God. Jesus had to be fully God for his sinless sacrifice to infinitely atone for sin and fully man so that he could undergo the penalty for sin as a substitute for man. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Also in verse 4, Paul says that Jesus was born under the law. Not only was Jesus born a man, but he was born a Jewish man. He lived in a Jewish home, circumcised on the eighth day, read from the Torah, and attended a Jewish synagogue. Like all men, Jesus was obligated to obey God's law. He obeyed God perfectly in everything, making him the perfect sinless sacrifice for sinful man. In verse 5, we see two purposes why God sent forth his son. Jesus became a man and was put under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. The first purpose is to save us from being enslaved to sin and Satan's rule. Jesus went to the cross as payment of sin debt for all of his elect who, under, who are under the curse of the law. Christ, through his substitutionary death, purchased believers from the slavery of sin and from the sentence of eternal death in hell. And secondly, so that we might receive adoption as sons adopted into God's family. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 describes God's election and the adoption process. It says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Adoption is not much, as much about our salvation as it is about our, our inheritance. As a child of God, you have an inheritance prepared for you. The Holy Spirit was given to you as a pledge of your inheritance, and that inheritance is waiting for you in heaven. 1 Peter 1.4 says that our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, and is waiting in heaven for you. As unregenerate people, we were by nature children of the devil. But God adopted us out of that family and into his. Please look down at verse 6. It says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Just as God sent his son into the world, so also, as a believer, he sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts is a sign and a pledge that God is our Heavenly Father. Paul is pointing out in verse 6 that an initial and basic indicator of our adoption is that we cry out, Abba, Father. One author says this about verse 6. He says, the Holy Spirit in you is crying. The verb here means a loud, urgent cry from someone in profound suffering, someone in fear, someone terrified, someone in pain, someone in loss, someone who is in deep need. What the Word of God is telling us here is that you know you are saved when you get to the point of suffering and your instant response is to cry out, Abba. Which means that you're saying, Papa, or you're saying, Daddy. This 
is the evidence that you are a true son of God. You rush to your father's arms. You know he loves you. You know he's your father. You know that he has all the resources. End of quote. So we're here today to celebrate the presence of the Spirit of Jesus in our hearts and to remember that through his death and resurrection, we have the privilege of crying out, Abba, Father. If you are here today and cannot claim the Holy Spirit's presence in your life, this time of celebration is not for you. Please allow the elements to pass you by. But we want you to know that we are glad that you are here. We also want you to know that as long as there is any life, any breath left in your earthly body, it's not too late to confess your sin and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. We beg you, turn to Jesus. He will give you the hope of eternal life. Please don't leave here today. Reach out to any of the uh, Grace Bible Church elders or, any, uh, or the person who brought you and find out what it means to receive the good news of Jesus Christ. Believers, please use this time to confess any ongoing sin in your life and to remember the privilege that we have as adopted children of the family of God. Please come and serve us. I'll be back in a few minutes to close this time in prayer.